We welcome to the show now, returning to the program, always great to visit with the founder of Journey and, of course, guitarist extraordinaire, Mr. Neil Sean. Good to see you, Neil. Good to see you, Eddie. How you been? I'm good, man. Staying busy. I know you have as well. Congratulations on the new album. Came out on Friday, Freedom. I know you and I have talked a number of times during the making of this record. It's got to feel great to finally have the thing out there, right? It does, man. It's been sitting there for a while, and they've been trying to get together, like, when are we putting it out? And it was set to come out, you know, earlier this year, and it never happened, obviously. And they kept pushing things back, I think, basically because of uh, the vinyl shortage and the long list of clients that are trying to get vinyl. And BMG wanted to put out vinyl at the same time as the album was dropped. And so... Uh, got pushed back, but you know the timing seems fine. When it when it first came down like that, I was I was a bit like miffed by it, and I was uh, wow, we're on tour here, we're selling out, you know, uh, arenas, and the album is not out. And I really I wanted to play more new material, and so looking forward to getting back out there. We've got a lot of plans, you know, uh, for the rest of this year. We're finishing out a bunch of dates, uh, and then um, twenty three. We're going out and doing the same thing. We're gonna right now. We're scheduled to do the first forty shows with with Toto again because uh, the chemistry works so well with those guys. I love playing with them. Our audience loved them. Uh, you know, musically it was a good combo, and so we're doing that. And we're talking about going, you know, overseas with them and possibly uh, doing some stuff with a three bill with Santana and going oh, wow. into you know, Europe and, and South America and some different areas, which to me, it that would be the coolest thing ever because it's basically my 50th anniversary. That's where Journey came from. You know, uh, the demise of that particular band after Caravan Sarai with Carlos. And so it kind of makes sense, you know. For you know, are you still, you're in, are you in close contact with Carlos still? We know we ju he just had a little bit of a health scare. Do we know if he's okay? Have you heard anything? Yes, we've been talking and he's he's feeling really good. And I said, you know, look, I said, take your time, man. Take your time coming back. You know, um, I think, you know, the heat was like a bit of heat stroke, you know, from playing outside venues that he's playing. I said, man, I got to get you inside. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a lot more comfortable, you know, and you don't have to deal with 100 plus degrees. Uh, and, you know, it's just it is a lot easier. Uh, to control the atmosphere that you're playing in and much more comfortable. And, you know, speaking of the other, uh, the act you did do touring with, with Toto, I am seeing you play guitar and Steve Lukather play guitar in the same night is absolutely a treat for anybody that loves guitar playing. Did you get a chance to, to jam with Luke at all on that? You know, I, I invited him a bunch of times and because they were in a bus and we were flying it never worked out, you know, and then when it was going to work out, we were going to do it. And one of the last few shows we did, then, you know, one of the guys got COVID and we had to cancel the last four yeah. shows. Uh, but, you know, because it was going to be the last show with Toto before we went to Canada and do the two dates uh, with with Ann Wilson, uh, we were going to do it. And then it got canceled. And so um, he's, he's just such a monstrous player. I love him. You know, I've been watching him for years and it, it's very, very cool, man, to be out with such great musicians, you know, and they raise the bar, we raise it, you know, it keeps, it keeps everybody on their toes. It's great. Neil, let's talk about this album for a bit, Freedom, which again, the new Journey record is out now. There's a lot of artists with catalogs like Journey has, which, I mean, Journey has one of the great catalogs in rock, and, and, and you, you have a great problem in that you have so many hits, it's hard to almost play them all sometimes when you play live. I remember when I saw you recently play live in Vegas, I said to you, you could actually open with Don't Stop Believing," and the crowd wouldn't leave because you still got 10 more songs everybody wants to hear. So when you look at a catalog like you have and the hits you have, what's the driver for you to want to still make new original music? Because you and I both know there's a lot of bands like Journey that have been around for a long time that just do the nostalgia and just play the hits and play the catalog every year. What was the driver for you, most importantly, to want to make new music with the band? You know, I, I'm in it to be creative, you know, as a guitarist and, and as a musician. And I'm always put, 
pushing the envelope, you know, I, I need to come with new product. And, you know, we, um, nobody was really interested in making new product in the old band as it was. And there were some musicians that were just, you know, fighting me on it. They were like, I'm not interested in doing it. Uh, so, you know, I went outside the box and just did, you know, more solo records and, and just compiled a lot of material, kept on writing. But really at this point, um, Eddie, you know, I, I want, to, uh, you know, I, I felt this was a great opportunity when I was working with Narda, uh, Michael Walden, just the two of us to experiment quite a bit and try to carve out a new chapter for Journey somewhere that we hadn't really gone. And that was to touch on some of the, the harder rocking funk rock mixture um, and, you know, a little tougher sounding stuff with a different strut, you know, to it. and. I wanted to go for tempo, you know? We have a lot of medium tempo rockers that were built for stadiums, you know, because the fast stuff that you write sometimes goes over everybody's head because you're in these big washy buildings or it's just, you know, it's because of the sound itself in a bigger place that the thicker, slower mid-tempo rockers always sound huge. But I'm always like, do we have any more fast stuff to play, you know? and um, in our older catalog, we had a lot of up-tempo stuff. And so I wanted to write, you know, coming from that kind of a vein and stuff that we could actually use. And, you know, like the, the hardest thing to do in a 90 minute set, as you talked about, is fans come, they want to hear all the hits. If you don't play the hits, they're going to be disappointed and they're going to be pissed. You can't make everybody happy. And, you know, I'm one of them, you know, I'd love to play for three and a half hours, you know, which I have before, just, you know, not so recently, but a little bit in the past. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm really feeling like in the future, we already have pretty much 23 and 24 planned out to go back into stadiums in 24. After 24 and 25, I feel that that would really be like the 50th anniversary of Journey Show because I want to do a solo show, an evening with much like Rush used to do in, you know, the, the um, arenas and do a three and a half hour show or three and a half plus. Uh, we've done it before. We did it in Chicago when we first started this, the leg of this tour in 22. Uh, where we did, you know, an hour and a half or more and then took an intermission and came back and did more. We have tons of material. Uh, there's no reason not to play it. And I'd really like to construct just a mind effing show, you know, that sort of encompasses everything that we've ever done and use bits and pieces of all this heavier prog stuff in between songs to get from song to song to song, you know, a la early Zeppelin, when I used to see them live, they never played anything like the record. You know, they mm -hmm. played, uh, they played, you you recognize the song, but Paige was always pressing the envelope. He was like, you know, coming up with new riffs and they jam on the riff for a while before they went to the new song. And, you know, it's so funny. It's like um, managers, uh, for the most part, they look at, at their bands like, you know, a moneymaker and they go, okay, Every song needs to be a hit. If everybody doesn't stand up after every song and clap, that means you got to take that one out. And I'm like, you know, I'm older school, Eddie. I used to go to <laughs> Fillmore West. I saw The Who a million times there. I saw Zeppelin in Winterland. I saw Hendrix in Winterland. I saw Jeff Beck. You know, I saw all the greatest guitarists that came over from the UK in that era. And... Um, Nobody was standing up the whole night and going nuts after every song. They sat on the ground and they were listening and watching. At the end of the show, they'd, they'd erupt, you know? So it was more like a, an early Japanese audience or a European audience that were there content with watching and listening. And then at the end, showing you that they appreciate you. So, you know, I'm of the other school. Where I think you can go by people's heads, make them think about it a little more. And Journey is definitely one of those bands that are capable of doing that. Do you think some of the pressure for that, Neil, comes from the fact that you and I know that the value of touring and what touring is about and live shows is about has changed so much. Used to be you toured to, sold, to sell the record. Now the record's almost the promo for the tour. 
and touring has become so competitive because it's where the artists make the money and everybody's on the road. So do you think that that pressure coming from whether it be agents or managers is driven by the fact that you let up on the pedal a little bit, we got to make sure every year you come back, people want to buy tickets and they're not walking out the door. I'm with you. I'm fully in, in your camp. That's As a fan, I want what you're saying you want to do. But I think the counter argument comes from the fact that touring has become the, the driver where it used to be the other way around. You used to, as you well know, you tour to sell the record. Now it's almost like the record's the lost leader. Yeah, well, you know what? Yes and no for me because... We've done the other thing. We played the greatest hits for a year, for like two decades now, over. And and so I think by the end of 24, when we're actually back in stadiums again uh, and and doing an hour and a half and making everybody happy and, and including a bit of the new record in there and figuring out, you know, masterful way of, of playing it all. At that point, our audience is going to be ready for a long show. And the people that are gonna come and see an evening with, they're gonna expect it, you know? If you're playing with another band or three bands, uh, you know, on a bill, like in a stadium, uh, they're gonna expect you to come with the hits because, you know, that audience is much larger and a lot of bands sell tickets too for for the same, you know, event. And right. so, um, yeah. Tell me about making this record. We talked about it took a long time to come out, but. Narda Michael Walden was originally in the band when you made the record. And I know he co-wrote a lot of the record with you. And, and now you've got Dean Castronova back in the band playing drums. So Dean's not actually on the record, right? Talk about the, the, the record coming together recorded versus now what you're doing live, because there's some change there that, that happened, right? Right. Narda and I started a record uh, with John and John was mainly writing lyrics and, and some melody here and there. But Narda and, and I uh, got together, we sort of, you know, took the bull by the horns and we recorded like about 35 songs of which we put, we picked 15 to go on this album. Um, he was intended to be in the band as well as produ co-producing the album with myself. Um, he had some complications health-wise. Um, one of our, when we ended the first East Coast leg uh, in in um, Philadelphia or not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, and um, you know it was a bit of a scare for him. And I just thought, you know, uh, I was glad that Dean was out there at that point with us, and we had two drummers um, because he just, you know, it was fatiguing for him. He hadn't been on the tour in a long time and he found out how demanding this band really is of a drummer. And Dean is, you know, Dean's a racehorse, man. <laughs> the guy can sing the whole set and actually play all the drum parts and come off stage like nothing happened. You know, I mean, yeah. he's running miles and yeah. he's just an animal, you know, he's a monster. So Dean is not on this album drum wise, Narda played phenomenal uh, drum parts, though, I feel, on this album. And Dean has learned them all. Okay, that's how cool Dean is. He's never like, well, I'm not going to play that. I'm going to play my own stuff. No, he digs in, and he's like a sponge, you know. Uh, and he just soaks it all in. He learned it all. And when we go to rehearse, he knows it better than anybody else. <laughs> I had to ask Dean. I had to go, where do I go now? I wrote the thing, but I can't remember <laughs> where I go. He goes, bro, go over here, go over here. And no, 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 you're going there too soon. So he's kind of like a musical director, drummer, you know? Yeah. Uh, and how about Randy? And Randy Jackson is on the record, right? But he is not touring currently, right, with the band? Right. Randy underwent uh, a back operation as well. And, and so he was unable to tour. I wasn't even aware of it when he was working on the album. Uh, and then I found out about it when we were nearing the end of it. And he was just not able to to get on stage. He didn't feel good enough at that point. Uh, and he's still, you know, getting back uh, to feeling 100 percent. And, you know, we started out with Marco Mendoza, who was a phenomenal bass player. I, you know, I felt like after we had played for a bit, some of the stuff sounded great with Marco and some of the stuff didn't sound great with Marco. I think really due to the fact that he was in too many projects. I mean, a guy never sat still. We were really busy. And he was like in Europe. Okay, he's over, you know, here, he's over there. He's got like four different projects going on. I think he just really couldn't hone down on 
you know, the parts that were needed to be played in our band. And, um, you know, I just felt like um, at that point, I was like, I, I kind of said, Marco, you need to like dig in here a little bit and learn this stuff. And he goes, I'll keep that in mind. And I went, okay, I'll keep it in mind too. Oh, and then that's the right answer to the <laughs> boss. <laughs> no, I was like, well, it's not even on the bus. I'm just like, let's play the songs the way they need to be played. You know, I mean, the, right. these are, you know, songs that are in cement, embedded in cement. Everybody wants to hear them like that. Right. You know, right. He's certainly capable of it, but, you know, it just didn't happen. I started getting further and further away from it. Actually, we after we played iHeart Music Festival, we headlined that and we kicked butt, man. We did really well. But when I went to mix it um, with our longtime engineer and, and producer, Dave Kamalski in Nashville, I was listening uh, to the mixes and I'm going back and forth with them. And the bass was kind of in front of the drums. And I was like, it's for us, it's supposed to be the other way around. You know, the bass sitting in back of the drums to open up this big pocket so guitar and everything else can fit in the middle. And um, it wasn't, it was kind of squeezed, you know, when I tried to put the guitar in, it sounded really just kind of, you know, squeezed. And um, at that point I talked to the guys and everybody agreed with, with my assessment of it. And, you know, I suggested, um, actually my wife suggested and and I thought it was a great idea to bring Todd Jensen back. Mm -hmm. uh, Todd Jensen is just a solid, solid, bass player uh he's more from a, a rock and motown uh school and you know he's played with a lot of pros and you know i i had you know the opportunity to meet todd years back uh when i produced the hardline record and he first came in that band when we first started and then later after that after that disbanded uh i was out with paul rogers doing the muddy waters blues tour and he had other musicians you know in the rhythm section and he was getting really pissed off because they couldn't remember the material. And at that point, I said, Paul, I, I know two guys that can come in here, which was Dean and Todd. And I said, they'll learn everything. And you won't even have to rehearse. They'll walk on stage and they'll know the set. We go mm -hmm. over a couple endings, beginnings and endings, how you want to begin. And then and it's over, man. And so Paul agreed to go with me. And he, he loved it, you know. And at that point, I went, wow. I really have a great connection with with Dean and Todd. Todd sits in back of Dean, you know, and he he kind of hones him in even a little more. He pulls the reins back and makes the pocket nice and big. And he's just like a no nonsense guy. There's no drama. There's no BS. Uh, I love working with him. And let me ask you a few things, a, a, a quick thing here on your singer, Arnell, because having just seen you guys play live in Vegas not too long ago, it's it's still remarkable to me what he does and how good he is at what he does. And I know that there's a moment now where he catches a little blow in the show because he gets to walk off. Dean takes a lead vocal. Your keyboard player, your, his name escapes me, did a lead vocal at the tra at the show I was at. Uh, what, what's his Jason name? Durlaka. Yes. Yeah, Jason Durlaka, yeah. He sounded great. And then he so but but Arnell, in listening to the new album which again came out on Friday. So it's out now, folks, the new journey album, Freedom. Arnell's voice just, it walks that line perfectly in sounding like classic journey. But to me, Neil, he's also in the, whatever it's been 15 years since he's been in the band has come into his own and really put his own stamp on this as well. So I think he's really found that perfect balance. Do you agree? I do agree. And, you know, he, he absolutely loved, the new uh, chapter that I was talking about, you know, there's four four songs on this album that that are in a different place, uh, you know, than than what we've done in the past. And um, it's come away with me. It's holding on. It's all day and all night, and let it rain. Okay, those four songs to me are the new chapter for Journey and making a new statement. Where I know, um, and you know, when I wrote a lot of the vocal parts it was me and narda out there scatting you know coming up with the melodies and the turns and stuff and when he heard it, he goes oh i love this stuff and then he just you know knocked it out of the park uh with with narda producing him and um he says i love this new you know this new place we're going here it allows me to be myself like you said uh and you know we have the familiar sounding stuff there too 
on this album, a little bit different vein, especially with with a couple of the ballads, um, a little more R&B. Um, but this album, I think, is very well diverse. You know, there's totally. there's a lot of different types of music on it, much like I think a combo of Escape and Frontiers. And and you know, it's funny. A lot of our fans are saying that that have been our fans for many many years. They didn't know what to expect with this record. And as you can imagine, the, the, the animals out there, they're like, you know, ready to take you down and throw spears at you. <laughs> and well, that's the world really, we're in now, they, unfortunately. Right. And after they heard it, they were pleasantly surprised. They're like, wow, this album is really fucking good. I'm like, yeah. what can I say about it? I love it. You know, come away with me is one of my favorites. What was the origin of that song? Um, you know, it just started with me jamming one day in the studio like Rain and the other rockers I told you about. I It wasn't a song. It was just a riff. And um, it was the fun thing about making this record was we weren't really working with a computer all the time from second one to, you know, the last second of the day. It was the last thing that we did. You know, I'd go into the studio with Nard and it was really just him and I in a room. And I, you know, I'd say, what do you want to do today? And he'd say, well, what do you want to do? And I go, I got a, you know, a couple of riff ideas. Let's just jam for a bit. And so that song just started with me and him jamming. You know, we got the groove going. I started playing. Then I came up with the bits and pieces. Then we arranged it like in about five minutes, laid it down. I overdubbed on it. I played some bass on it, I played some lead guitar on it. And, um, you know, scattered some vocal ideas and artists scattered vocal ideas and we shipped it out, you know, to everybody to work on. Um, so, you know, this album has got a lot of that in it where it was not preconceived songwriting, which I think shows and adds some, you know, like magic to it a bit uh, that, you know, it's in the moment. It, it was created in the moment and it wasn't too thought out, you know, um, I really believe in that, that, you know, you can you can write a hit song and you can work on it years. You can work on it, you know, 30 minutes. Um, sometimes they just kind of fly out. Some other times when you have to work on it really a long time. Then it usually is not that big, you know, you overthink it and it ends up sounding like that. So, I mean, did don't I think, did, don't you know, stop. Did, don't stop believing. Just fly out. Or did you work? I'm curious. One of the biggest songs ever. Did that just fly out? It well, it did in a sense that you know I'm sure they worked on the lyrics for a bit, honing it in, Jonathan and Steve. Uh, but when we got together musically to put the song together, uh, John brought in you know he brought in the verse that it starts in and ends up being the chorus in the end. But the chorus only happens once, and the song is at the end of the song. So it's a really peculiar arrangement in that song, right. where. Okay, so he's playing the piano, the dead and dead and dead and And I start like moving around the guitar, like bass. I'm looking for some kind of a Motown bass thing. And then John finished that out. Uh, we put that together and we need a B section. Okay, so I came up with the strangers waiting, that little part there that gets us in between the verses. Uh, and I was like, you know, doing my Jack Bruce thing, coming up with the counter bass parts uh, for Ross in that one. And uh, while we were putting it together and then we went, you know, we went from a verse to a B section back to a verse, no chorus. OK. <laughs> and so I started doing the little breakdown, of the guitar solo that sounds like uh, she took the midnight train going anywhere, which dictated what what the lyrics ended up being uh, before the lyrics were there. Uh, then we went back to the B section again. Strangers waiting up and down a boulevard uh, shadows. Um, and then mini guitar solo. Everybody's like, what? You know, the record company is like, this format, I don't know. I think you should chop it up. And we go, nope, we're not doing It'll never anything. Work. We're it. <laughs> That's what they said, basically. You know, <laughs> the coolest thing that our, our ex manager and our original manager, Herbie Herbert, ever did for us was he put in our contract that we would never have to deal with an AR guy from our record label, anyone telling us what we need to play. They weren't even allowed to hear the album until it was finished. And I oh, mean wow. mixed. 
And so that was the coolest clause that he put in our contract, I felt, ever. Because, yeah. you know, after we moved on after that, it was never the same. You know, yeah, and I, I was bet. like, what about that clause there? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, what the hell are you talking anymore. about? <laughs> what yeah. are you smoking, Neil? Claws? No way. <laughs> <laughs> Neil, you're returning to Vegas where you're going to uh, resume uh, doing some shows there. I saw you play at what was the Hard Rock and is now the Virgin a few months ago. And the show I saw, you actually, I remember coming back and talking to you before the show, you actually played that night, you told me you're going to play the greatest hits record, start to finish in sequence, which you did. And I remember saying to you, that means Don't Stop Believing is like the second song of the night. And you're like, yeah, I guess so. And I like, but you have so many hits, you could make that work. So you've done a few different things in Vegas. You've done stuff like that. You've done a different balance set and you've played with an orchestra before. I think around that time it was at Caesars. You're about to do that again at Resorts World in Vegas. So tell us about this next run coming up. Yeah, we're, we're going in. Um, our next show is on this Friday and Saturday and then the preceding week after that uh, uh, or the latter week after that. So it's four shows all together at Resorts World, brand new place that AEG opened up. And uh, it's supposed to be the state of the art. I've not been there yet, but everybody that's talked to me about it said, wow, if you love Caesars, you're gonna love this place. It's even as, as good or better and holds a little more people. So, um, and we're doing it with orchestra there. Uh, and so we have not even rehearsed yet. <laughs> The pressure is on, man. We got we have one day to rehearse with the orchestra. Uh, we've been off for like what five weeks, something like that. And um, I got to go and rehearse the new stuff that we're going to play today and try to remember it, even though I wrote most of it. <laughs> so it's like a cram session and one day to get ready to play. Uh, but usually we have no problem doing that. Everybody kind of does their homework, uh, and we'll be ready to go. But I don't know really what the set is going to be at this point. I think we're going to move it around from uh, show to show because we have many more songs to add that have been orchestrated from a long time ago when we did the Hollywood Bowl and we actually played with a hundred piece uh, symphony there. And that show was never released because management never quite got the licensing together uh, with the Hollywood Bowl. And they tried to hit us up for a lot of K and we just went, no, forget that. So it just sat there and we had the arrangements that were done so we'll have some stuff that will be coming in from infinity on, uh, you know, and really, I mean, I love some of the stuff that we did back then. It was like open the door. Uh, it was patiently. There was, you know, winds of March uh, and, you know, um, some stuff off of Revelation uh, that was newer with Arnell and um, City of Hope. And that stuff sounded killer with orchestra. It's what I remember. So I'm looking forward to that. And then we'll be playing, you know, some of the new album. Uh, I don't know exactly what cuts, but like I said, I need to rehearse tonight <laughs> and refresh <laughs> my memory and get into it. And uh, but um, in and we never had time to orchestrate that stuff. So we'll just be rocking that stuff without the orchestra. Uh, but it should be an interesting show. Uh, I was going to ask you, is there point. is there some stuff in the set, even the older songs, that you're just going to play straight up because orchestra doesn't really fit? Like, in other words, something like, I don't know, Stone in Love or Separate Ways, maybe to me doesn't sound like you could find a way to put orchestra in that. Maybe you can, but are there things like that that you'll just play straight up and the orchestra won't participate? Anything that was on the greatest hits record that you saw has orchestra on it because that's what we like really uh, moved to do the last time in Vegas. And then, like I said, we did a longer show at the Hollywood Bowl where we did many more songs that were already orchestrated and charts were done. And so we're gonna add those from night to night. I don't think we can play it all in one night. It's probably too long or possibly we can. Right. And then beyond that, you mentioned you guys are pretty much booked out through through even through next year. So. This is just, do you, I, I mean, I remember Def Leppard's out there right now on this stadium tour with Motley Crue. You guys famously did that with Leopard a few years ago that went phenomenally well. Is there, is that something that you'd like to revisit going out and teaming up with another big band and going out there and doing a stadium run like that again? You know, Leopard and I have proven to be a great combo. 
Yeah. We love those guys. We get along really good. The audience loves us both. You know, and we have a lot of strength. I mean, I don't recall one night that I looked out in the stadium and there was one open seat in the house or on the floor. And so, you know, we're definitely talking. And, you know, that's a possibility for 24 right there. Yeah, I saw you guys on that tour in Denver. It was uh, at the baseball stadium there. And it was, I, I just, I walked in through the back and I walked out to front of house and I looked up. And usually you look up in the stadium and those, you know, those last few rows back in the back a little, you know, it gets obviously bad seats, a little spotty. The thing, I've never seen, I don't remember seeing a crowd like that in a really long time. It was really amazing. And the energy in the building was incredible. Yeah. An amazing time. You know, we've done it before with, with, with Def Leppard and, you know, uh, we love those guys, you know, we get along really good, just personality wise. And uh, it's, it's a good combo musically too. And the fans yeah. love both both bands uh so it's a you know it's a great show and so hey, we neil, look forward to playing with them again and neil um you made news recently in an interview where you mentioned that you have start you've you, you've had dialogue again with steve perry can you elaborate on that a little bit well you know um <laughs> there's we you know he likes to keep everything very private and he probably doesn't like that i even talk about it you know, he's probably going to be pissed that I even mentioned it, but you know, it is what it is. We started talking again and I found that it was, it, we had a good conversation and it was just, you know, basically very friendly. And um, it's the first time that I talked to him on the phone in a long time where I didn't have to go through his attorney. Uh, and that was kind of nice. Um, and, you know, we were talking about many different things. And so, um, you know, definitely it was nothing about music at all. You know, it was just basically catching up uh, some some things about business, some things about how you're doing in your life, you know, just general friendship stuff. And, um, you know, looking forward to moving forward with him like that, just as a friend. Well, if you if you don't want me asking what facilitated the reconnection, did you reach out to him or vice versa? Or was it something unrelated that you had to talk about and then it just rekindled it? Well, to be honest, it, it was about the trademark that I've atta attained. <laughs> and, you know, it's really crazy, but, you know, my wife and I diligently, you know, investigated our trademark for the last five years of trademark of our merchandise uh, after being lied to for many, many years from everybody that we were paying that worked for us and uh, made us believe that it was trademarked and it was never trademarked. And I don't know if you've seen, I, I, every store I go in, it doesn't matter where I'm in, it at in the world or, or I could be in the Caribbean, wherever there's journey stuff, massive amounts of journey swag all over the place. And so uh, we moved to get it trademarked. I got threatened by everybody under the sun that they were gonna sue me, right? And um, and I started wondering, I go, wow, this could get really hairy here. And she goes, forget about it. It's not going to happen. <laughs> you know, nobody's got anything on anybody. This is just what it is. You know, people failed to do the job. And so we stuck to our guns and we got the trademark. We, we ended up uh, getting full trademark of everything. So now after all these years, everybody's going like, hey, wait a minute. And I'm like thinking to myself, well, how come nobody else knew about it? How come your attorney didn't know about it? Your attorney is a smart guy. Why would why do he why would he not know about that? And then I would think, oh, well, they had private banks. They had all this kind of stuff going on. And I'm like, I was the only one that wasn't a part of a private bank, you know. And uh, you know, I'll leave the rest of the imagination, Eddie. Right. So as far, just closing out the thing about Steve, so you're just on a good talking relationship with him again. There was no dialogue about music or singing or anything like that. Nothing at all about music. Nope. And Neil, I'm, I'm curious about this. We talked about the band being 50 years in and having seen you guys recently, again, the band sounds incredible. You're doing great business, making new music. Do you see where you'd like to where the end is for you with journey as the guy who started all this, do you see a farewell or a retirement anywhere down the line? Or are you just going to keep going with this as long as it feels good? 
because you all know, you know, bands that have been doing this 40, 50 years run that farewell tour bit, start talking about ending. I mean, you seem as energized as ever. Do you just want to keep running with it? I do. You know, I do. And, you know, you make the necessary changes as you're going along. If things don't work out with somebody, you, you, you move, you know, um, I'm definitely not done here, you know, and uh, I want to get to that evening with Journey show because that's going to be the most fun of all for myself. Uh, Cause I, I enjoy playing long, man. I have no tendonitis in my hands. You know, I, I could play for six hours straight you know, and have a blast doing it. And so the more, the merrier for me. And um, I just want to bring fans like the best possible show I can bring them night after night and for many years to come, you know, unless something were to happen where I'm just not able to anymore. I don't see any end in sight. Yeah, and one last thing I wanted to ask you about, and this is um, unrelated to Journey, but you – the other day I was in LA and, you know, Ronnie James Dio was a dear friend and I host all the events for his uh, cancer fund and everything. And it would have been his 80th birthday on uh, Sunday, yesterday. So we had an event at the rainbow in LA last week that I hosted, did a radio show from. And a lot of people brought up hearing aid to me and stars and that recording. And I remembered among the many people that was in that you were in it. Do you do you have any recollections of that day and experiences with Dio and being a part of Hearing Aid and that uh, charity recording? I do, actually. And um, it was really funny, man. It was in my party days where I was partying pretty hard. And I was living in Marin County and I'd been up all night, uh, <laughs> you know, smoking three packs of cigarettes and doing everything else I'm not supposed to be doing. And I, I remember calling him in the morning. I was supposed to jump on a jet. With my guitar early in the morning, I never made the flight. So I called him and I said, Ronnie, he said, I can't make it, man. I'm like, you know, not in good shape. And he says, oh, no, you're making it. He says, you're one of my main <laughs> players. You have to be on this. And so he, he, he got on me and he sort of like smacked me around a bit on the phone. <laughs> and I went, OK, man, OK, OK. I said, just get me a car and a, a later flight and I'll come in. And if you can get me. You know, I know there's a zillion guitar players. If you could move me up in the line so I don't have to wait all day because I might fall asleep. I haven't gone to sleep yet. And so uh, he did. He says, I promise you, when you get here, I'll move you right up to the front of the line. You know, maybe two or three guys in front of you. That's it. So that's what happened. And it was, you know, I got there and it was funny, man. I was met with a lot of obstinance from most of the guitar players that were there. They kind of looked at me like in a... I felt like I was in a jazz bow room, you know, with a bunch of jazz guys. They were kind of snooty. They looked at me like, what the fuck are you doing here, man? You don't belong <laughs> in here. This is this heavy metal guitar player. You're not a heavy metal guitar player, you know? And I go, well, you know, let's just see what I bring, you know? Uh, so, you know, it's funny. Ronnie moved me up to the top, top of the line and there was uh, Brad Gillis that was in the studio and he was doing punches for on a solo for about an hour like one bar punch another bar punch and i'm like looking at the watch and i'm sitting next to ingve and i'm going man when is this going to get done i said i'm falling asleep here and i told ingve i said man when i go in there i swear to god i'm going to do one take from beginning <laughs> to end, and that's going to be it and there's going to be no punching and i said you know i just don't believe in that you know and i and so it was uh george lynch uh, ap, I think it was Ingve before me, George Lynch after me, and I followed Ingve. So it was like a little heat, you know, and everybody were like vultures in the room. I mean, if you see old film, you got Dave Manichetti like this standing over me like a hawk, you know, <laughs> like an eagle, like I'm going to eat you up and spit you out, you know. Him and I always had this thing, you know, in the Bay Area like who was the baddest ass guitar player, you know? And I love Minichetti, you know, we played many things. Y and T, man, he was a strong force, you know? Yeah. And so, you know, they were trying to turn up the heat on me mentally, you know, by everybody crowding around. And I just was kind of numb to it all. Blocked it out and I did what I said, you know? I plugged in, I brought a st my strap with me, brought a little uh, Boss DS1 distortion pedal that many people have used, went into the Marshall, 
said, roll the tape, did one take. And I go, I looked at Ronnie and I go, I'm good with that, man. He goes, oh, come on, man, do one more. <laughs> and I go, it's not going to get any better, I can tell you right now. <laughs> and that's just what I know about myself. I'm, I'm usually like a one take guy. And it usually goes downhill the more times I play it after that. So I did another take and he kind of looked at me, kind of scratched his head. He was like, okay, I think the first take is better. And I said, okay, thank you. I'm out of here. I'm going to go to sleep now. I'm going to get back home. And, uh, but you know, uh, was your connect, yeah, you know, was I your connection, was your connection to it? Because you mentioned you weren't the, although I'm sure you influenced a lot of those guys and a lot of them, were, were probably very, um, even though they may have looked at it competitively, pretty pretty impressed to have you in the room with them. Was your connection to being into invited to that just history with Ronnie? Do you remember how you got tied into it? Um, he, I, did you have history I, with Ronnie? Uh, no, I did not. I mean, I obviously knew who he was. Uh, right. I had a lot of respect for Vivian Campbell. You know, I met Vivian at, at uh, NAMM shows. You know, down in L.A., him and I, you know, had exchanged, uh, you know, uh, a lot in, in a magazine before that we were on a cover of Guitar World or something way back. Uh, and, you know, I, I told him I loved his work with with Ronnie James Dio, uh, Rainbow in the Dark. You know, I remember watching that when I came on. I go, who the hell is this guitar player, man? Yeah. It's just shredding, shredding, you know, I was like, wow, hot hot guitar you know yeah. and uh so maybe you know vivian and those guys suggested me i don't know or ronnie maybe was a fan i never asked you know right right was, well was it, it's all surprised that yeah, they ended no. up using a lot of my footage yeah it's awesome and you're in the video and everything and it's very cool and it's an interesting uh, piece of history there that i always wanted to, to ask you about well listen man i could talk to you forever i appreciate a few minutes here today and everybody check out the new Journey record. Again, it's called Freedom. It's available everywhere now. And uh, Vegas, you've got this weekend, 15, 16 at Resorts World. Then again, the next weekend, 22 and 23, I'm going to be out there. So I'm going to try to come see you. A few other dates coming up this year as well. You can find them all on the Journey website. Hopefully see you in Vegas, Neil. Thank you so much for the time. Always good to visit with you, man. Thanks, bro. Good to see you. I'll see you in Vegas. Say, Bullet, Paye, Go, John, Bye.